First, I have to say food. Because when I said, okay, I'm going to give a talk on women, the thriving force throughout the history of the, of the church, I was thinking the whole church, starting back in, in uh, apostolic times and coming all the way through. Well, I found out that's a heck of a lot of information and much too much to present now. This is after hours of research and writing. Last night I decided it was too much. <laughs> but I do want to say from the very beginning that one of the best kept secrets in Christianity is the enormous role women played in the early church. Jewish women disciples were among Jesus' earliest followers and were significantly involved in the active early church. In fact, women were the major witnesses of the crucifixion and resurrection. They were at Fred Jr. <coughs> There's women. There you are, the <laughs> Um, so they were present at the, uh, resur at the crucifixion and resurrection when the men were not, and they had the proclamation of Easter. Even this was entrusted to the women and not the men. They ran off to tell the men about what was going on. Few women were taught to read and write, so they could not tell their own stories. Since they lacked a life, and since they lacked a voice in public life, they lacked a voice in history. It's interesting to note um, that in the Bible, there are only 17, there are 1,700 distinct personal names, with only 137 being women. Including in the Apocrypha, Apocrypha, there are more than 600 unnamed women in the Bible. Many are, are identified in relationship to their husband, their sister, their brother. And uh, we, see this, this, we see this coming down even to this very day. Uh, an interesting fact was um, in one of our women's groups in 1957, the number was 243, and only 24 were listed with their first names. They were Mrs. Joe Smith, Mrs. whatever. And out of those 24, three of them were single, so of course they, they, they had their first name. Uh, with all the men have, um, history has certainly been rewritten, and it's easy to see that. Uh, we see that in the Bible, that things were changed frequently, and often it was, history was written about women, or, or got rid of the history of women, and that was from a male perspective. Now that they're, in the last 20 years, there are uh, more women going into the, finding more historians that are women, and so a great deal has changed. This is particularly seen in the story of Mary Magdalene that much has been pro proven that that story was, was incorrect. And many, many more women are being brought into the, um, being known to us. As you know, shortly after the Civil War in 1872, the Board of Missions of the Presbyterian Church decided to organize a Presbyterian Church here in Fort Townsend. And that, at that time, we were in the Washington Territory. There were only two Presbyterian churches in this whole area. One was in Seattle, and one was on one of the San Juan. As a woman, I'm mighty proud to say that our seven founders were women. And it gives me great pleasure to inform you that through the magic of time travel, Five of those women are here, and they're going to share with us just about their lives. Would you, would you ladies stand up, please? Let's give them a hand. Well, as Paul said, 
so business could be made. Isn't that great? It wasn't until 1974 that a woman in the United States could sign her own mortgage. That's <laughs> Then the women really got to work. In 1973, they found uh, the late founders that are formed, the Lady Society, and, and established a Sabbath school or a Sunday school. Oh, this is a later in time picture, but I have it up there for you to look at those two organs. Work meetings were held every week and they had their first fair in 1876, netting $300. And with it, they purchased carpet for the aisles and the rostrum in the new church, doormats, chandeliers, a sewing machine, and they also bought those two organs. One went in the sanctuary and one went in the Sunday school. For the next eight years, the women pretty much carried this on, the, the church on, on their own with very little assistance from men. And it wasn't until eight years later that men joined this church. The cornerstone of the old, of the old, old church was laid in September 6, 1875, and the first stone and the first stone church, which held 150 people, was erected north of the Columbia River. This is a picture of the Sunday school, and this is something that I didn't realize that the the stone church was really just a sanctuary, and they built a wooden building that housed a library and um the sunday school and so these kids are standing in front of that wooden building in 1879 the ladies ladies society raised the money to purchase a lot for the manse at a whopping cost of 126 dollars <laughs> september 6 1875 um, and you saw the wooden building. <laughs> the, lady, the, the Lady Society raised the money to purchase a lot for the man. I thought I said that. Okay, from 1884 until 1960, the man was the home to many a minister and his family. As I say, the last one lived there in 1960. It became the Hawthorne House which is a meeting place for senior citizens. The neighbors, and then they were for neighbors in need, food bank and a clothing bank. It was sold to the highest bidder in 1975. It is said that the ladies kept the Sunday school, the church services by stitching away many a dent. And I think the quilters will know about that. At least know how to do it. Much credit is due to the ladies' societies for the faithful, forceful, and devoted efforts. Work brings results every day. Let's now meet these ladies. Elizabeth, would you come up? By the way, they're all of Scottish uh, hair, Scottish. Reformation uh, tradition, and many of them have very young children. I was surprised to know how young they were. Yes, I, I do look very young, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, good afternoon. <clears throat> I am Elizabeth Eisenweiss, and I am so happy to welcome you to our church. 
which I've played a role in founding, along with six of my friends. Martha, Melissa Jane, Hattie, Janet, Nellie, and Jane. It was a daunting task, but it has been so satisfying, we know it has a great future. My maiden name is Wetterhauser, and I was born in Germany, although I've lost my accent. <laughs> Getting here, crossing the Atlantic, and finally making it to San Francisco was a journey I have no desire to repeat. But I did meet this charming German immigrant, Charles Eisenbeis, and we married in 1865. San Francisco was boisterous and crowded and very immoral. <laughs> so we decided to move to Fort Townsend, because it has such potential as a great port, and to get in on the ground floor was just too tempting to resist. Mr. Eisenbeis is a baker, and he specializes in biscuits and hardtack to provision all the sailing vessels that stop here. He is constructing the first stone building on Water Street, which will be his cracker factory. I am 27 years old, and we have three children, a daughter seven, and two boys, very hyperactive, five and one and a half. Mr. Eisenbeis is hardworking and headstrong, and I understand in the future he will become mayor of this fine city. His business will expand into groceries and real estate, among others. He's even going to build a castle, as well as donate land for a hospital and land that will become a fort and eventually even a state park. I unfortunately will not be here to see that. And you'll hear about that later. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I forget to my daughter being Martha. Good morning. Oh, really? oh. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Martha Burns, and I'm so happy to see you all find people in this beautiful structure 150 years in the future. It's changed a lot from the humble stone church that we're building. John and I came here from Nova Scotia. He had been a sailor and discovered Port Townsend in, as a 20-year-old. I managed to get him to settle down, and we married and moved here, where he became a real estate agent. We have three lovely daughters, Maggie, Annie, and Elizabeth, all under 10 years of age. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law live with us, and they help me with a household. John has become very successful, and we have a lovely home uptown on Lawrence Street. In addition, we donated land in 1870 to the Masonic Lodge to be used as a cemetery, and I understand that it will be called Laurel Grove in the future. Six of my friends and I started this church uptown, and I'm proud to say that the first man to join is my husband, John. <laughs> in fact, in his eight years, only two men joined the church, and frankly, neither rendered much assistance to the affairs of the church. <laughs> Our lovely home was constructed by Horace Tucker in 1808, and we moved in shortly after. My family loved living there, and the children loved Port Townsend. However, peering into the future of 1874, I know that John receives a job in Tacoma, so we'll sell our house to Charles Pink. And it's as if we never lived there, as the house will forever be called the Charles Pink House. <laughs> In fairness, he and his family do live there much longer than we did. What's important in the church 
what is important is in the church. And I'm delighted that it lives on for 150 years and more into the future, serving its members and its community. May God bless you all. <laughs> Hi, I'm Helen Calhoun, and I have very good hearing. <laughs> but please call me Helen. My sister Jane, soon to be a Calhoun also, and I are founders of this church, along with five other hardworking women with whom we spend a lot of time eating fresh scones, drinking tea, and organizing the First Presbyterian Church of Port Townsend. My sister and I were born in Glas <coughs> excuse me, Glasgow, Scotland, close enough to Ireland, <laughs> and to my family. So how will both of us end up with the last name of Calhoun? Well, I'll tell you. George Calhoun's family, good Scottish stock, had lived in Maritime Canada since before the American War of Independence. This charming young man returned to his roots to study medicine, and we met and fell in love. Simple as that. We married in 1863 and moved to the state of Maine, where he began to practice medicine, and we set up a household. He joined the Union Army in 1865 and served on the battlefields of the Civil War, saving many poor young soldiers' lives. It was a ghastly war, as all wars are. Anyway, I was home caring for our infant son when I got the worst news you can imagine. George had been killed. I wouldn't wish that anguish on anyone. Fortunately, for us anyway, word came that George was unharmed. It was the poor soldier next to him who had been killed. It was not fortunate for the soldier and his family, and I'm sorry for them. War is so stupid. After the war, we left the East Coast and headed for Washington Territory, where George became one of the first physicians in Port Angeles and Port Townsend. He gets called out in all kinds of weather, setting out on foot, on horseback, in canoes, and even lumber boats. We have five children, all under the age of 10. God love them. We played host to many relatives with several of George's brothers, as well as my sister Jane, who stays with us from time to time. In fact, George's brother Samuel and Jane hit it off, as you say, in the 21st century, and will soon get married. The reason that Jane is not here today is that she and Sam are in LeConnor looking at property to buy. I think he plans to be a farmer. One of the things Jane and I noticed in Fort Townsend is that there are a lot of Presbyterians living here, but no church to worship in. So we decided to change that. With the other ladies here today, we gathered support from our husbands and friends in the community. We wrote a letter back home to friends in Glasgow, and they sent a donation to help us build the first stone church here. After much prayer, a lot of faith and courage, and hard work, we have taken the big step of starting the First Presbyterian Church. We are excited for the potential of this endeavor. Thank you. Janet, would you come up? By the way, because of time travel, these ladies ask if they could leave their corsets and petticoats at home. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're just hanging loose. <laughs> <Not our makeup. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and for pants. No. <laughs> anyway, my hello, fellow Port Townsenders. I am Janet Del Gardino. I was born Janet Loftus in Scotland in 1839. When I was a teenager, 
Our family sailed to America, and we ended up in San Francisco after the gold rush. We were late to the party, it seems. However, this Scottish lass caught the eye of a Scottish mariner, Captain James Delgardino, and we married after a whirlwind romance in 1858. Shortly afterwards, we sailed north and landed in this great city of Port Townsend. James became a pilot for the Strait of Juan de Fuca and occasionally takes a ship down to small towns, Seattle and Tacoma. We opened a family business, the Del Gardino Hotel on Water Street for sailors. I can't imagine any of you staying there. I wouldn't let you. But these rowdy sailors do need a place to stay. James sometimes had to brick a fisticuffs, or worse, but he pretty much ran the hotel and the household. I've had to break up a couple myself a couple of times. James is thinking about turning or running for the city council as he is not happy with the leadership of Mr. Waterman or Mr. Katz. Just last week, I was seeing James off for a piloting job at the city wharf, owned by Waterman and Katz, and it collapsed. I had to scramble up a series of broken beams, and fortunately, only tore my petticoat. But poor James, the schooner is a total wreck. He had complained about the condition of the wharf, but the place fell on deaf ears. We have three children. The oldest, Jimmy, is 14, and he can be trying at times. Can you believe this? Just yesterday, he put grease on Widow Jones' doorknob, <laughs> and she had a terrible time getting back to the house. <laughs> she was so frantic. And thank heavens, Jimmy is washing all of her windows today as the punishment. <laughs> Our other two children, Mary Jane and David, are much younger and haven't started testing their parents' patients yet. <laughs> I suppose concern for the future of my children and the generations to come is what made me become so committed to helping establish this church. Thank you. Okay. Would you come up and speak about yourself and your mom? Certainly. Harriet Phillips, though I prefer to be called Patty. My mother, Melissa Jane, is home with little Jimmy who has measles. Poor little guy. Anyway, she would have loved to be here today to celebrate the establishment of this fine church, but family responsibilities won out and she insisted that I come. Well, I've been asked to tell you about ourselves. My mother, Melissa Jane Carlton, was born in 1815 in Maine. She married, and she and her husband moved to Illinois, where I was born, in 1841. Not wishing to get involved in the fighting, my family packed up and made the trek across country in a covered wagon during the Civil War. Let me tell you, that was six months of misery. But this country is so beautiful, it wasn't really all that bad, I must say. Of course, none of us, the founders of this church, were born here. We are all of European descent and have come across the country, some from Europe, to get here. The Transcontinental Railroad was just completed four years ago, but all of us came here well before that. There are no interstate highways or flying machines. Whether we came by wagon train or ship via the long way around the Horn, or by crossing the jungles of Panama to catch another ship in the Pacific, with half of the people suffering from cholera, Every journey was difficult and took months. 
Those of us who made it here are survivors, and hard work is no stranger to us. Anyway, we arrived in the Puget Sound area, and initially I taught school in Jefferson County and on Whidbey Island. Then I met this handsome young man, Tom Phillips, from Cornwall, England, and we were married in 1869. We settled here in Port Townsend, living in a log cabin down on Water Street, where Tom has set up the first blacksmith shop in Port Townsend. He's been successful, so much so that we moved into our new home last year. It sits kitty corner over there, and I know that Jimmy loves playing out there in the yard. My mother, who lives with us, and I, saw this location across the street that was empty at the time of moving in and imagined a fine church serving as a beacon to all. It is so gratifying to see that 150 years later, the church still stands on the bluff with its beautiful steeple and magnificent organ and its history of reaching out to help others, not just in Port Townsend, but across the world. Thank you. of we're living here in Port Townsend and knowing it's a Victorian town. I assumed all these ladies look like these ladies. But obviously that's not true. They were just all starting out. I think uh, eventually, uh, like Isaac Mine with his building them in Jurassic Castle, obviously that uh, they did make money. But when these were, women were working, they were not fancy ladies. They were living in log cabins. Interesting. Well, at this point, we have the Ladies' Society. Um, in, in 1889, the Ladies' Society of Church Workers was begun with 17 members and $26.75. It was decided that they would use that money to help furnish the building. The first attempt was to organize a fake. $30.35 was cleared. And it was the beginning of one money-making adventure enterprise after another. That also the, it was the beginning of the annual church fairs, which were held in December for many, many years. It consisted of ice cream, chicken pie, and various booths. These ladies here, I believe, are in Chester Park because the ladies would go themselves every year for an annual picnic. And so I kind of am taking some liberty and, and, and thinking that that's the, the women at, the, at their picnic. During the next four years of its existence, the group raised an amazing sum of $3,112.38, all of which was spent for various church purposes, the organ, and the carpeting for the entire building were two of them. Through the, through the years, the organization raised thousands of dollars through countless socials, dinners, and bazaars. Repair improvements without number were paid for by the labor of the women. So looking into the future, less than 100 members decided that they needed a bigger structure. This structure ended up costing $19,747.85, with the organ costing $2,500. This edifice became known as the greatest edifice in Port Townsend. Well, in 19, 1890, word became official that the Oregon Improvement Company had gone into receivership. The panic and depression of 1892 was quite paralyzing. The town and the church suffered both uh, numerically and financially. The boon had burst. When we see this building, with no money coming in, they, there was a $9,000 debt at this point and they couldn't even pay the interest. Another woman steps in. Uh, Reverend Smith, the, the minister that we hear so often about, this is him. 
This is the, the man that was out in his garden and came in ill, and in two days he was dead. So it's a very young man. So I'm this. You can see this sweet lady raised those three children by herself. This lady was in Portland, and she owned, held the mortgage. And Reverend Smith negotiated with her, and she said, okay, I will forgive the debt of, uh, I will reduce the debt to 9000 but 1000 of it must be paid by you all, and you cannot get a loan. You've got to raise the money. So Reverend Smith and the ladies went to bat, and they raised that thousand dollars. In December 31st, 1901, the remaining charter members, Hattie and Janet, <clears throat> held a chafing dish with a mortgage in it, and one of the kids started it on fire. This is Hattie. <clears throat> this is the one picture that we that I can find. I'm sure they're around, but this is obviously much later. But um, it's fun to actually see a face of someone. The chandelier in, so we, we have two women's groups have been formed now. The chandelier in the sanctuary was given by a, a group of young ladies, and guess what their names were? Rosebud girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. The Rosebud Girls. Again, I'm hoping they are. They just look like you, you know, girls. And I designed it. Assigned that their name. Uh, also, uh, a woman on her own gave uh, the communion table at this time. When it was determined that the pipe organ was just too big of a luxury, they were talking about not putting it in. And it, since it, um, because it was such a big amount of money they just didn't think they could well two women went out in the town and solicited fifteen hundred dollars leaving uh, uh, three hundred dollars to be paid i'm sorry so left another <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but it was a song <laughs> so the women had pushed $300 for cushions for the seats, which you notice we still don't have. <laughs> and they decided to pick up the rest of the, forgo that, that pledge and put it on money toward the organ. And because of all of that, and assuming the debt, most likely without these women, we would not have our organ. In 1906, a rose window was in trouble. The, the um, several attempts had been made to repair the lead that holds the glass. The, get, the glass was settling, and the whole window was in danger of collapsing. Uh, extra storm window was, a pot, was put, installed and solved the problem at a cost of forty thousand oh, yeah. dollars. So we go from not, you know the church not costing so much to this. In 1907, a much needed kitchen was provided by the Ladies Society of Church Workers. That, the building cost $171.78. And that, that must have been much later with the, with the window because things are so much cheaper. I'll get back to you on that. They bought, a, uh, not only did they build the kitchen, they put in a gas stove. And the Ladies League, the Young Ladies League, gave put in the water connections, the sink tables, and covers, and shelving. A, the, a refurbishing of the um, mass was needed, and the women, it was no, no debt was incurred because they paid the 605 dollars to me. This is interesting, and, and I think um, Paul should listen. The pastor <laughs> received from the Lady Society the Christmas gift of a magnificent four-section gun bookcase. Mrs. Smith received from the Ladies' Society a fine bathrobe and from the Young Ladies' League a beautiful hand-embroidered tea towel. <laughs> they also, the women at this time also uh, supplied uh, 
equipment for the Sunday school class. And now we're going to get to that. This is the period right now. This so this is moved out of the old building, the old wooden building, into this building. So um, they uh, they gave a piano, a library, maps, and a magic lantern. Okay. All from oh I'm sorry, this is Helen Clark gave the magic lantern. It's also called a stereo octagon. Okay, that now another women's society comes in, and this is the, the women's society, the women's missionary society, and it was founded in 1890. They've given countless, they, the women in this church have given countless years of service by raising funds, sewing for mission hospitals, collecting clothing for relief overseas projects, supporting missionaries, preparing and sending Christmas boxes to mission stations around the world. Enlightened members and working of the state and district organizations of home and foreign minister, mens, missions, many returning missionaries were heard to guest, as guest speakers here. Mission studies, sewing for mission hospitals, collection boxes, and clothing for overseas relief, preparing and sending Christmas boxes to mission stations and raising the annual appointment and money for missionary work were the principal activities of the missionary society. They also at that time took on uh, uh, the Nia Bay and that, that our association with Nia Bay lasted for quite a while. It was later renamed for a lady named Evangeline Campbell. She was uh, one of the very early members and very, very active. So those two organizations became too large, thought the minister in, in 1940. And he thought that, that should, they should be divided up. And that's when we became four circles. And it was Mary Martha, Marion, church workers, and um, Evan, uh, Evangeline Campbell circle. These are two pictures. This is the, the, one of the last meetings of church workers. And that's uh, Miriam Circle having a Bible study. So Mar Mary, Mary Martha disbanded, I don't know when. Church workers disbanded in 2009 due to lack of leadership. Miriam is still active. The evening, there's now an evening circle that was originally for women that worked. And it's now become the Tuesday okay. afternoon circle. In uh, 1959 is when Presbyterian women came into being. The, the church had split, and so the Southern and, and Northern, and we came back together, and the organization was formed. And its government is exactly like the government of the Presbyterian Church, with the local church, Presbytery Synod, and uh, we call it the church-wide organization, but the assembly, the General Assembly is yes, in the church, the main church. Each group has several gatherings. Well, and but our church would have about four a year. We enjoyed lunch together, had outside speakers, and conducted business. This was a. This was also true of the Presbyterian and the Synod. So this is an installation of officers. Now, this is uh, another of our gatherings. And it was Woody came and took off the front of the organ and, and um, demonstrated the organ for us. And this, because Woody is a biker, this biker babe came in <laughs> and introduced him. <clears throat> I bet you don't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> In fact, there were several people that were a little upset that I was there <laughs> until they found out who it was. <laughs> All right, so this is um, the women gathered around Woody at the organ, and there he is uh, talking about it. And there's some faces that we haven't seen for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> 
the churches took turns in the presbytery of having uh, their gatherings, and this is the uh, year that we have it. it. And the the theme of it was it was a small world after all. This picture is this coming picture is really bad, but. Jack and Debbie saying Disney's it's a small world after all and put the earworm in us forever. <laughs> and into them. They were real happy about giving it. One of the fun things about um, this gathering was the men dressed up like leaders and and served us. The sad thing about that picture is only two people there are still alive. It's Jim and Dave. Every year there's a church-wide gathering, and this is in Louisville usually, and um, I'm happy to say that two for two, of, this is held as a triennium that's held every three years, and I was the voting delegate representing the Presbytery um, for two of those times, and this is a voting. Um, I was also um, secretary of the Presbytery, Presbytery Women for, I don't know, five, six years. And delegate to the Senate. So we were at, the, at one time, this church was very, very active in Presbyterian women. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the big things we did was direct left by Mary Maltby was the nativity uh, display every year. You know who these kids are? Milo and Emerson. They're the Dirks and grandchildren. <laughs> There's a, a birthday offering that's held every year, and this came about by the um, originated before even Presbyterian Women was uh, established, the organization of Presbyterian Women. And uh, we would collect money every year called the birthday offering. Well, once we left the uh, Presbyterian, the way we came away from being part of the Presbyterian women. Uh, we just continued to do it here and gave the money to to, um, to uh, missions of our choice. This is this is to depict all the mission work that we did do. Um, in, in 2007, we had a fair trade market. It was head, held up by, led by Kate Robson. And both of those, all that pro proceeds went to the missions. And so the mission was uh, benefited as well as the fair trade people. That's the group of people that put it together. For several years, we sponsored the Networkers Mother's Day card program, which provided um, mosquito netting for women, mostly women and children in Africa. For years, we every month, we set up about six tables in here and had equal exchange product sales. And all that money went to support the Santa Elena project. Later on, that, this project was taken over by SAGE. A very, one of the major uh, things that Presbyterian women did, as well as Miriam Circle has continued, is that of supporting Dove House. We have given over 150 baskets since 2010, and the, the sweeper was given when Dove House first opened and they had requested a sweeper, so we gave that to them. Uh, Helen Ann Scour is instrumental in putting these love months together. Um, they're given when women come into the shelter that just they just come in and don't have any toothbrush, paste, uh, soap, or anything like that. So Helen has really kept that up for a long time. This is one of the water projects we supported, a model of it, where the rainwater comes off the roof and goes into that uh, receptacle. We, we, many of you will remember this, we, for, we supply these backpacks full of uh, school supplies for immigrant kids. This was not so many years ago. 
just to name a few, Presbyterian Women and um, Miriam Circle <coughs> provide mission support. And I'm sure that I, I don't, I'm not up to date on Tuesday's um, meeting their collection. I think you have a collection once a year for mission. But in <coughs> such places as Echo, Jefferson Healthcare Hospice, Haiti Nursing Foundation, PC USA Disaster Relief, San Elena Home Building Project, Medical Benevolence Society, Aqua Via El Salvador, and on and on, Heifer Project, Olympic Angels. So due to the lack of leadership and our aging population, in 2010, a Presbyterian women disbanded. And it was a very sad day. Um, but we continued uh, on with using Horizon Bible Study, supporting mission, and meeting the needs of men, of members through prayer, fellowship support, love, and mutual concern. The women of this church have given countless hours of service to follow the footsteps of many named and unnamed women who have steadily and faithfully spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And they have significantly impacted our church, our community, and American culture. And I know this sounds like the, our emphasis was only on money. And part of this is that women were so active because they had no other role other than being in their home and being at the church. And so they had, they were able to, to put a lot of into these um, various money-making things. But that wasn't the basis. It was the, what the church is about that was really important to them. It's clear that much has been accomplished by the women of the church over the past 150 years. The organization, our organizational names have changed, but the basic principle and purpose remains the same. Now, you want to know what happened to the seven women? <laughs> Elizabeth, sadly, Elizabeth Eisenbeis died at age 37. <coughs> Her, um, as Elizabeth said, her husband remarried. Ellen Calhoun moved to Seattle, where her husband set up a medical practice on Pioneer Square. As mentioned, they were looking for land. Well, indeed, Jane Calhoun moved to La Conner shortly after the church was about founded. Martha Burns moved to Tacoma. The only two people that stayed in the church were Janet, and, and most of them left, or several of them left, because of the economy that was going on. Janet Delgado remained active until her death in age 64 in 1903. Hattie Phillips died in 1928. She had been a member of the church for 55 years. Wow. Melissa Jane Carlton, mother of Harriet, we don't know what happened to her. So, does anyone have any things to share about thinking back over the old times with the various organizations, with the Presbyterian women or circles? Or any questions? I have one too. Okay. You were talking about how long Katie was, uh, how, how long Katie was a member? Yeah. It was 58 years. 55. 55 years. Remember Lorraine Troutman? Yeah. She joined when she was 18. She was here for over 65 years before wow. she died. What was the name? Lorraine Troutman. Yeah. One of the original pioneers. Yeah. Beth Johnson's mother. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for coming, and I hope we've all learned a little bit.